Perfect. Right, it's no, two o'clock, no, no, no. so I think I'll make a start as people continue to come in. Um, welcome everyone to this HCV Action webinar, looking at how services in England are recovering from the latest wave of the COVID pandemic. I've got five speakers today who we hope will be able to give you uh, quite a full picture of how hepatitis C elimination efforts have been affected and what the next steps will be with them. I'm really grateful to all of them for giving their time today. First up from NHS England, we will have Professor Graham Foster, uh, National Clinical Lead for Hepatitis C Operational Delivery Networks. Graham will be talking about the story so far with hepatitis C elimination and the COVID-19 pandemic. Then we have Mark Dylan Powell, Head of Programme for HCV Elimination at NHS England, who will be talking more about sort of the future and the next steps. After Mark, Stacey Smith, Director of Nursing at Humankind, will be talking about how drug treatment services have been affected by the pandemic and their work on hepatitis C. Um, and then our final speakers, Colin Lawton, Northern Regional Prison Lead, and Julia Sheehan, Women's Prison Peer Coordinator, both from the Hepatitis C Trust, will be talking about the work in prisons over the last year. After everyone has spoken, we'll put your questions to our speakers. Please type all your questions either in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, either way, we'll come to them at the end. Um, and yeah, we'll only be answering questions at the end if that's okay. Finally, I should note the webinar is being recorded and a recording will be available on our website afterwards. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, Professor Graham Foster. Graham, do take, us, take it away. Thank you very much. I'm hoping that everybody can see my slides. I'm seeing nobody dissenting from that, so I'm assuming they're up. And thank you very much. My job is to give you a quick pre-see of the story so far and then hand over to Mark for our future plans. The plan as you know from NHS England is very simple, we want to control the numbers of people treated by setting targets and we want to drive people to hit those targets. From the very beginning we've enforced outreach, we do want people out there treating people where the people are, not dragging people into clinics and we want to keep an eye on things with the data. We've set targets for each of the networks and these are challenging targets and they are deliberately challenging but so far you'll be pleased to hear we have met them. We've enforced and will continue to enforce MDT meetings. The purpose of MDT meetings is to make sure that every patient gets optimal treatment. I'm not interested and ne never will be interested in a service that has two standards of care for those who turn up to hospital and those treated in the outreach clinics. There's no need for that. Anyone can assess a patient, discuss a patient with an expert and make sure that that patient gets expert treatment. So by setting up the MDTs, we're making sure that everyone gets the best possible standard of care. And we're also allowing people who are inexperienced in the field to access treatment and to actually start dispensing and prescribing medication. So the purpose of the MDTs is not to block treatment, not to delay treatment, but to enable everyone, everybody, to get best possible care. And the reason we're so keen on outreach is that this is a virus that hides around in prisons, in people who use drugs, in homeless shelters. This is a virus in communities that traditionally don't access our model of healthcare. And that's a failing in our model of healthcare not a failing in those individuals. So most people with hepatitis C have more sense than to want to come to my clinic, so I've got to go out to them. And that's just how it is, and that's the way we want to continue. We've been doing this, of course, for a long time. Uh, this was our study that we published in 2008, going out into the community with interferon and treating people, so we know it works. But what it does need is highly motivated people who have the time and the skills and that's difficult to set up because addiction services are very busy they're constantly pressured they have more and more work and covid i'm afraid is adding more work to them so what we tended to do is not to skill up people in addiction services but to send into addiction services nurses from professional clinics and that's something that's worked really well, but I think we have to ask the question whether that's the right model for the future. And Mark, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about how we see that changing as we go forward. So just because it's worked well up to now 
doesn't mean that's the right thing for the future. What we want is to have lots and lots of different places where people can access treatment. Every time you bump into someone, you should be offered hepatitis C testing and treatment. And we want to do that across the board, not just with the nurse-led outreach clinics. This is the sort of level of support that we've seen so far. You can see that it's reasonably comprehensive, but there's not a great deal to it. And Mark will show you later on how we're expanding that dramatically over the next year or two. But that basic care model has worked reasonably well. We have on the registry over 50,000, it's about 60,000 patients now. Getting on for 56,000 patients have been treated. We've seen a 43% reduction in liver transplants and a 34% reduction in deaths. Just think about one other disease where deaths have fallen by 30% in the last two or three years. It's just unthinkable. That is an extraordinary achievement. And it's really a testament to all the hard work of a large number of people. But stopping 30% of people dying is just a huge step forward. And I think we should all be very proud of that. We know the drugs work. This is real world. This is your data. This is showing that our success rates are well over 90 odd percent. Interestingly, in the people with very advanced disease, it's a bit less than the people with early disease. So the sooner we treat people, the more effective it is. We were doing great, of course. Here's the escalating numbers since DAAs came in. This is PHE data, increasing numbers, and then COVID struck. And although these data are not data that we're broadcasting too widely, I'm happy to share the impact of COVID. You can see that COVID treatments drop very quickly. This is data, by the way, taken in February. So March is zero because you can't treat anyone in March when you're still working in February but you can see this drop off in treatments that was caused, I'm afraid, by COVID. The good news is that we have managed to pick up a little, but we're still not anywhere like where we would like to be. Testing and drug services, I'm afraid, you'll hear a little bit more about later on, but it dropped quite dramatically in the first COVID wave. This was because I think a lot of us were completely unprepared. It wasn't something anyone had anticipated and we got caught out with lack of space, complete absence of PPE, a lot of fear in clients, a lot of problems with laboratory capacity. And I think a lot of those we found solutions for in the second wave. And I hope that uh, colleagues today will be able to give us a little bit more good news as we move forward with solutions to the problems. Not all bad news, of course. This is the in-reach teams that have gone into homeless shelters across the country identifying people with hepatitis C who were temporarily housed. This is a real success story with a lot of people tested. And I just draw your attention here to the difference in positivity rates in London, less than 10%, and elsewhere where it's around the 20% mark. And that we think tells us that London is in a slightly different place from the rest of the country, perhaps with fewer patients to find. So we've made extraordinary progress and a 30 odd percent reduction in deaths is the figure that I keep bandying about because I'm most proud of that figure. Fewer people are dying of hepatitis C than ever before. It's clear that they can, there are some areas, particularly London, that have gone a little bit further, a little bit faster, and that shows what we can achieve if we put our minds to it. But I think post COVID, we've got new challenges to face and we're gonna have to change the way we work. So my final slide is the one I always show, which is get out there and get tested. And I know someone who will endorse that is Mark. I'm going to get Mark to show you all the wonderful things we're going to be doing this year. So let me hand over to Mark, hopefully without now, if I can work out how to get my screen off screen share. There you are, you're off. Over to you, Mark. Noah, did you want me to share my slide or are you going to do I, that? I can do that, don't worry. Yeah. Okay, and um I'm I'm 
could just going to leave this slide up while I'm talking so um, people can have a look. Um, you will recognize it from uh, previous times. I've um, I've been keeping one of these, a, a version of one of these elimination initiative maps really since I started so that I could try and keep my head around all of the things that we were supposed to be doing. Um, I suppose just in terms of next steps and, and how we recover um, from this end of the pandemic. A um, couple of things that I'd probably mention. Um, people will know that we've had a, an ODN run rate um, so the numbers of people that we expect to be treated by the ODNs per year um, for a number of years now. Um, and what we had to try and think about for 2021-22 was what that run rate should look like. Um, clearly, we all hope that we're in some phase of recovery given the uh, vaccine program for COVID and so on, that we're going to be able to kind of get back to um, a level of ambition um, that, that we need to be at. Um, so we still wanted to look at um, being ambitious, really. Um, in 2019-20, we achieved um, around 12,500 individuals in treatment. Um, and that's kind of where we want to get to in 21-22. Bearing in mind, we've had a slight drop in this current financial year with, with all of the um, restrictions that we've been working under. Um, we need to get back to about 12,500. And that's the run rate that we've set nationally. Um, so the thing we had to try and balance with that was the fact that um, the ODNs, the clinical services, um, as well as all of our wider partners have been really hard hit by COVID. So a number of the ODNs have had clinical staff who've been um, seconded out to go and work in ICU or in uh, COVID wards. So we actually need to let those people get back, let them catch their breath, maybe take a bit of time off. Um, you know, we we've got people who've been through an awful lot and um, what we don't want to do is is break them um, by by jumping in now and saying we've got to go for, we've got to go really fast so we had to kind of make that balance so what we've actually done is we've given the ODNs 10,000 just over 10,000 um, in their run rate and we've given NHS England a run rate of um, over 2,000 so um, Graham and I now have our very own run rate for NHS England, um, which is a, a, an unusual position for us to be in. Um, and each of the ODNs has their run rate as well, because we wanted to make it up to the 12,500, but we had to accept that actually we can't put the same degree of pressure on the ODNs that we might have done in the past. So, so that's where we're at. Um, really how I see it is kind of ambition with caution. Um, and by pressing that ambition, one of the things that we've been able to do with NHS England is that I've been able to go back and make the argument about our elimination initiatives and how we need to not only continue with the things we've previously been doing, but we need to introduce some new elements of elimination initiatives so that we can get to where we need to be and therefore we need a bigger budget. Um, and as of yesterday, um, I don't even think I've told Graham this yet, um, that budget was approved. So our elimination uh, initiatives budget for 2021-22 uh, um, is actually £5 million more than last year. So we've had a, over a 25% increase in our elimination initiatives. Um, so we will be progressing um, with speed, really, because what we need to do is we need some degree of catch up. We've got things to continue with that still need some improvement. Um, and we've got some innovation. And I'm just kind of going to kind of give some of the highlights from the um, elimination initiative map that's on the screen, really. Um, the column on your left, as you look at the, the diagram, prevention is a new column that we didn't have in our elimination initiatives last year. What's become increasingly clear to us over the course of the year is that um, we've been dealing with our uh, standing population of people who are infected with hep C um, through accelerating treatment uh, interventions. But what we haven't been doing is impacting enough on um, new infections. So we've been emptying the bath, if you like, of all of the kind of um, people who, who are infected now, but we haven't switched the taps off 
So we've still got people coming into the system who are uh, new infections, and we need to tackle that hard and fast now. Um, so we've work, been working in partnership with uh, PHE, the Association of Directors, in Pub Directors of Public Health, and a whole range of other partners um, in the statutory and third sector um, to look at things like needle exchange mapping, um, the expansion of availability of low dead space syringes, the availability more widely of equipment to make sure that we're, we're in every area able to say that we're meeting the uh, international standards for the availability of, need, of injecting equipment, what the interventions are in needle exchange, so reviewing those to make sure that things like naloxone, harm reduction advice, wound care, um, as well as hep C and other BBV testing is all available. Um, preventing reinfection amongst the, the cohort of people that we have been able to treat and also working closely with integrated care systems as they emerge and develop um, to look at place-based planning across uh, local authority and health boundaries. So that's a big piece of work that we're taking forward that will hopefully have an impact on um, uh, our rates of new infection. Um, testing and diagnosis was always here, always on the elimination initiative map, but there are some uh, new elements that you will uh, you will see um, from the 1st of April or, or that we've started and will we'll gather a pace. So the community van programme we've just approved for um, a further seven ODN areas for them to have a community van um, going out testing and um, Find, you know, patient finding and providing access to treatment. So rather than expecting people to always pitch up at the hospital or pitch up at a service, we're going to go out and look for them. So that's the, just the first seven because they were ready to go. Um, and we'll plan to kind of keep expanding on that during uh, 2021. The testing uh, web portal is something that um, I know that a number of the drug treatment services, the addiction services have started to um, offer postal testing um, and we're going to be looking at something fairly similar through a web portal, um, similar as well to some of the national sexual health services. So individuals who may have a um, historic uh, risk um, from risk of infection can literally just go onto the web portal order a, a DBST um, and be put in contact with, um, with services um, should that test uh, turn out to be positive. Um, one of the other key areas that will be um, rolling out in 21-22 um, is in relation to emergency department testing. I know that some of the ODNs have already um, made a start on this and had a couple of um, demonstration sites or they've done some work in relation to testing in emergency departments. But really this comes down to some of the work that we need to start doing, um, looking for people where they're not necessarily presenting because of bloodborne viruses. So. Um, and where we might not expect to find them. So there are parts of the country where we can still walk into any drug service and find a, a, you know, a good number of individuals who need testing and treatment. There are other parts of the country where actually it's getting a bit thin on the ground looking for those positive patients. Um, and certainly in those areas, we're gonna see an increased benefit by targeting services that people turn up to because of their leg ulcer or because of an injury. So looking at opt-out testing in some of those settings um, like emergency departments will be, I think, a key way that we start to find some of that population who aren't presenting for hep C provision or aren't presenting for something related to hep C, but we can grab them while they're there. Justice system, um, again, we a lot of this is continuation work, um, but where we've started with places like probation on approved premises testing, um, we're going to increase our focus to the post-sentence supervision population and those on community sentence treatment requirements. So it's continuing but expanding and adding to. Um, people who inject drugs, some, again, continuing, uh, continuing work here, but some interesting additions that we're going to look at for 21-22. 
the first of, first of them is within our finance department at the moment, going through a level of approvals before we procure. But we're going to be looking at um, one or two demonstration sites where we can look at um, widening the venues where individuals can be treated. So they won't necessarily always have to be um, going to hospital-based treatment. So um, addiction provider treatment will be one of the first ones that we look at where we choose an ODN area. The ODN will ma maintain clinical responsibility and oversight for that provision, but the drug treatment service, the addiction service, can actually take over the testing, preparation, um, support, dispensing, and so on of, of, of the treatment to that individual right through to SVR 12. They will get a per treated patient payment and there'll be a smaller payment to the ODN for providing that clinical oversight. Um, so it's expanding some of those um, facilities where individuals can be treated and so not expecting them to always go to that kind of hospital-based third sector treatment. Similarly at the bottom of that list um, we'll be doing um, the same thing um, in relation to um, needle and syringe program premises. So looking at how we can um, put some clinical resource into those services so that we can identify, test and treat individuals who are accessing needle and syringe programs. Um, they don't have to actually turn up um, at a, at a hospital-based service. Um, and similarly with, um, with our GP primary care and our community pharmacy primary care um, in the next column, we'll be looking again at how we can drive um, not only things like the patient search tool that we've got, um, but also um, the standards that are already exist in relation to abnormal liver function tests in primary care and what should be done in terms of liver screening, but also GP based treatment. So can, can we have some GPs that um, look to provide treatment within the general practice setting? Um, again, with the clinical support and leadership of their ODNs, you know, uh, uh, backing them up. Um, then I suppose it's some of the opportunistic and community based things. So we will be um, moving ahead with the South Asian communities work and the uh, some work with Eastern European communities. And then we've got um, some pilots and demonstration sites in relation to places like sexual health services, making sure that every individual over a three month period accessing a certain set of sexual health services receives a hep C test so that we can kind of get more information about um, prevalence and positivity um, and work out what we need to do with those uh, those those settings moving forwards. And then again, there's our ongoing work with the ODNs and um, in relation to uh, data management and evidencing elimination. So I hope you'll see that there's, there's an awful lot going on. Things get added to this list all the time. Um, and if anybody wants to discuss any particular bits of it with me, or make suggestions, I'm more than happy to, to have those discussions with anyone at any point. Um, but um, potentially a, an exciting time ahead as we, as we move forward with some uh, new and innovative areas. Okay, thank you. Ah, thank you, Mark. Um, next up, we have Stacey Smith from Humankind. Stacey, uh, we'd like to take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think Noah's going to do my slides for me, hopefully. Okay. So the, the next slide, Noah. Um, it was very, very um, interesting time for Suffolk's Mistress Services um, at the start of the lockdown. As you can imagine, we had to change the way that we were working incredibly fast to try and um, reduce risk to our staff and to our service, to people that use services. So a lot of the things that we had to do really impacted on people accessing services and the interventions that we could do. So an example, we had to limit the number of staff on site to comply with COVID-19 premises risk assessments, but we did introduce priority intervention lists and all of humankind services remained open through lockdown as most substance misuse services did. 
um, but the, the traffic into services was really low and the opportunity for dry blood spot testing was really limited. Uh, number of people entered in services reduced. Um, we implemented online and telephone communications and interventions. We brought in um, postal dry blood spot testing. We also delivered um, needle and syringe provision to people. One of the really concerning things that was happening is that people weren't, ac weren't accessing NSP provision, which obviously has a, a, a massive impact for, for reinfection, um, reinfection and people putting themselves at risk. Many of the pathways were reduced or stopped during the process, so people reallocated, as been previously mentioned by Mark and Graham, uh, to different positions. So some of the access to treatment of hep C in, in a lot of the areas decreased, as did some of the access to the, the labs. So we, we really were uh, at a point where we, we, could, we were offering a lot of services. Our services were, were still happening, but we had to work very quickly in a very different way. Thank you, Noah. So this is, I'm actually showing you now the, the testing that happened for dry blood spot testing across humankind services. And I was interested, it sort of mirrored uh, Graham's uh, chart earlier. So we knew something was happening. So you can see that testing started to fall around about March. And you can see that we were still sort of offering people tests all through the, the lockdown. Um, but you can see sort of April, May and June by the, by the green line that testing basically it stopped or practically very, very low. And that was a period where we were readjusting ourselves to what was happening. Um, we were, you know, putting in processes to work very differently. Um, and obviously, you know, working with, with all our buildings and premises and PPE and all the risk assessments that we had to do. So it, it's quite a hard time to actually do any testing at all through those three months. But as you can see from July, um, as we settled into a way of working, that we started to pick testing up. It was always there as a priority. So if anybody came into services or we had access to people, then we would want to, you know, the first thing we would do is to, to try to offer them a test and do a test. So you can see, even though it's still very low numbers, um, we started to pick up testing and it remained consistent throughout, you know, August, November, December. Obviously the second wave had an impact. And it, it was very um, interesting to see that some of the premises we had, we were able to continue testing because we had bigger rooms that could uh, support the two meter distancing. And then other projects, we had very small rooms that couldn't support much testing at all. Um, like I said, we developed the, the postal testing to try and support, um, to keep some level of testing moving. You can see now by um, our, what we call resilience and recovery um, is around looking at our numbers coming through February and March. Now, interestingly for March, we're only halfway through March. So the stats that were involved in March is were very low. But what was evidence in March is that we've had quite a jump once we got all our figures in because we've been um, silently working in a way of pulling a way of working with, under lockdown. So we've work with our partners, you know, Hepatitis C Trust in doing very targeted work. So an example of this is a uh, recent work that we've just done in Staffordshire, where we've targeted a hub and the environment surrounding the hub and absolutely just tested as many people that we possibly could. Um, and I think uh, today there was something like 137 tests done. Um, we've worked as well for the specialist service within that area to try and make sure that that pathway is back in place so we can put people that come back positive through that system. So that, that's proved as we're starting to open up a bit more and started to become a lot used to some people are starting to access services again, um, be it in a, you know, in, in a smaller number, we're, we're starting that the sort of bringing on that targeted piece of work we will probably try and drive that network nationally so we can identify uh, hubs and services that weren't able to do as much testing as others and put that real sort of targeted response in to try and lift the testing uh, figures up again. 
So that is is probably quite an, that's a very honest uh, view of of how um, COVID really impacted on our testing numbers. Um, the good thing in that that there was testing happening, uh, although the numbers were low, uh, hepatitis C was still being talked about with people. Um, and one of the things we are, if you look at that second, the line above the green line, is that's Hep C offered, tested and accepted. For those people that we couldn't, who couldn't access testing at the time, we have got that, those individuals' data. So we'll be going back into services and making sure those people actually get access to testing now. So again, thank you, Noah. So from our recovery, um, one the first thing that I've put on top there is our partnership working. Um, through lockdown, it become very evident and coming out of, you know, in 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 this period now, this time period now, it's very evident that the partnership working uh, with hepatitis C trust, with the audience and, and the development of the provider network has been really positive in supporting and reinvigorating our testing process. So some fantastic partnership work on going with the Hepsi Trust within all our projects and some of the targeted work we've been doing in Staffordshire, we will drive through to other areas. Um, really strong working relationships with our ODNs in the regions where we have projects. And some of the advantages of that is that we're involved in all the networks within those regions so we can work closely with the specialist services, with the ODNs, we can support any of the pilots that are happening. We can also have a very honest view on where we where testing needs to be increased or where we've got uh, peaks and troughs or if, if we're having issues with pathways for for treatment or we're, we're looking at developing uh, pilots within projects you know really um, pleased to see that there's a, a development around treatment coming you know end-to-end -end treatment being a, being looked at uh, within services uh, I think that's a really excellent way forward um, so a really strong partnerships assist not only um, substance abuse services, but also having access, people having access to, to testing across the board. The provider network is a network that's developed for all substance misuse organisations where we meet and discuss best practice, new innovations, um, how each organisation is managing through, through the lockdown and learning from each other also supporting each other around external uh, campaigns. Um, we, you know, I think it was last year, we did a really successful tweeting and retweeting together as across, across the country. And I think it supports us in across, for some of misuse services in general, to look at how we're working together around elimination. So for humankind in particular, what we've done recently, we, well, all through lockdown, we've been identifying our PCR positives in services. Um, we are now really pulling these forward to ensure that they're getting back onto the treatment pathways. Um, and it's really important for us that we continue to look within our services for people who've missed retesting or who've put themselves at risk during lockdown. One of our, our biggest concerns has been around the fact that we've not really seen face to face the number of people that we're used to seeing and we're concerned that we may have a decline in people's health in general of people when they start to come back into services and we're not sure of the risk that people have been taking especially around their injecting behavior as, as one of the biggest concerns is that the number of people accessing needle and syringe provision has, has really dropped so there is a gearing up uh, when we, we finally come out of lockdown with our, our own internal roadmap about how we're going to address people's, the, the health of people and, and the behaviour of people when we start to see them face to face or see them more face to face. Um, as been previously mentioned by Mark, we, we are reviewing our harm reduction strategies, um, especially in relation to our, our needle and syringe provision. It is absolutely um, imperative that all substance misuse services have access to testing and treatment pathways within the NSP provision, uh, not just on site in services, but also in pharmacies or in outreach or wherever that uh, provision is being, being offered. 
um, we will be reviewing all our harm reduction strategies through our needle exchanges, especially in light of in light of lockdown and the reduced numbers coming through, but also in some of the Public Health England reports like the, the shooting up report, which has really highlighted some of the suboptimal practices across. So it's, it's one of our aims as we come out of lockdown to really look at what provision we've got and we're, ma we're mapping that. Um, we're also introducing, we're just working on introducing our wound aware pilots across all our services. And obviously naloxone has been a harm reduction strategy that is, is absolutely crucial, which will be part of the process. But we're also looking, um, it's allowed us time in some ways to think about access to services through the lockdown. So we're looking at how our models um, can sometimes cause issues with uh, with dry blood spot testing. So if you if you're not dry blood if you're not offered a dry blood spot test on first entry into treatment, sometimes that can be delayed. And what we're looking to do is to make sure somebody, whichever door they come into treatment, that one of the first things that happens is they're offered naloxone, they're offered a dry blood spot test, um, and they're offered other harm reduction information and advice. So that, you know, that's a big piece of work that we're, we're going to be embarking on. Um, as part of our toolkit, we're obviously driving postal dry blood spot testing across our services, um, and that is ongoing at the moment. Um, and for our, our internal work, we, um, just to, to give a shout out to Debbie Moore, really, we appointed Debbie as our national hepatitis C coordinator at uh, the back end of last year. And Debbie's like a force of nature. So she's already introduced a hepatitis C learning package for all our staff, which they are, um, which they're completing and we've got quite a deadline for that to make sure that we, we know that all the staff within our uh, front end services have, have got training and know how to you know about hepatitis C, know how to do dry blood spot testing, are aware of all the pathways. Um, we're rolling out training again for dry blood spot testing across services with support from our partners Hep C Trust. And we have got our internet page, which has been developed, which gives updates and encourages staff to be involved in all things Hep C, including internal and external campaigns. So it's once, hopefully, fingers crossed, we actually um, get out of, of lockdown. We're going to be, again, of all the harm reduction work that we're going to be doing, we're going to be driving sort of humankind's hepatitis C action plan across our services. Uh, through a network of, of service leads and hepatitis C champions. And I would just like to say a sort of a thank you to our partners for supporting us through, um, through the lockdown, but also supporting us through our, our drive uh, within humankind to, to eliminate um, hep C within our services. So thank you. Thank you, Noah. Thanks very much, Stacey. Um, just really quickly, I know we're taking questions at the end, but we just had one question come in about what PCR means. Could you just explain in layman's terms what that what that means effectively? So is that one for me, is it, Noah? Yeah, please, please. Well, in, in layman's terms, basically when someone has a, a dry blood spot test, uh, they may show up as having antibodies to that test. So once you, you've shown up as having antibodies, that means you've actually, you're actually, you've been in contact with the infection and, and somehow that's, you know, you've managed to, you're not uh, acutely infected. Um, if what we have to do then to is test that you, you're actually not infectious in, in sort of in layman terms and what the PCR does, it says whether you've got an active infection which needs to be treated. So the antibody, the first bit of the, the antibody tells us whether you've been in contact with the infection, whether you're actually infected at this moment in time. And then the PCR tells us whether you're actually got an active infection that we can treat. That's in very layman's terms. Thanks very much for that. That's great. I will very, thank you, um, Stacey, for your talk. I will very quickly now pass on to Julia and Colin from the Hepatitis C Trust prison team. Thank you very much, Noah. Uh, cheers, Stacey, for that. That was great. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so I'm uh, Colin Lawton. I am the Northern Region uh, prison lead. Uh, we've got Julia, who's going to be uh, sharing the presentation with myself, who's the Women's uh, Prison Peer Coordinator. Uh, so we, we were asked to put this together just to kind of like uh, outline 
um, the last 12 months, really, of how we as the Hep C Trust have had to change the ways we are trying to work, obviously, within the prison setting uh, due to <clears throat> unable to get as much access as we can normally get because of COVID. Um, but what I do need to mention is try and tell a bunch of peer educators that they can't do the job in the Hep C Trust has been an absolute nightmare because everybody, <laughs> everybody in the trust is so proactive I know personally for my team, trying to grow my team has been a hard task because everybody just wants to get out and get active. So what we managed to do, we managed to rejig uh, risk assessments, you know, work different ways to try and make sure the staff are all safe. Uh, yeah, and, and I think when you see what we've managed to do, you'll actually see that there's been a lot of success stories that has happened over the last 12 months. Next slide, please, uh, Noah. And I'll pass you on to Julia. Thank you, Colin. Welcome everyone. Um, so my name is Julia Sheehan and I am the Women's Prison Peer Coordinator. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our experience coming from a peer's perspective. Um, when the prison estate went into lockdown um, last March, as someone with lived experience of hepatitis C and of prison, um, I was quickly able to put myself back into those shoes for a moment and really imagine what it would feel like um, and some of the difficulties that I might face if um, all group activity was stopped, if work was restricted, if healthcare appointments were restricted, if face-to-face -face recovery work was restricted, if education became in cell and if all visits were stopped. And um, it became really clear to me that we needed to find ways as a team to support the men and women while still delivering the education. It's not only me that has uh, the ability to do that, the whole prison team um, has lived experience. Um, so we were able to quickly come together um, collectively and create new ways of working. Um, we really needed to ke keep Hep C on the agenda, still deliver um, training and most importantly support the men and the women in prison in challenging times for everyone. So um, today Colin's going to... Uh, give a little bit of an overview on COVID patients. I'm gonna talk a little bit about prisoner contact, helpline, hepatitis awareness training and peer-to-peer -peer training. Colin's gonna talk a bit about training peers, um, our newsletter, Way Out TV and Prison Radio, and both Colin and I have a follow me case study. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Okay, so COVID patients, I think uh, we've all had this over the last 12 months with the patients. Um, so basically, the, the last 12 months has been a real learning curve for, uh, for us with the, um, with the prison team um, because we've had to re reassess, rebalance, uh, look at you know, prisons individually because not, as we know, every prison is not the same. So it's every prison we've had to you know, communicate with and find out about you know, outbreaks, um, how bad that prison's been hit. I can tell you, being the northern, northern prisons have been very different from the southern prison, prisons. Um, so how we worked around this is that over the last 12 months, we believe that obviously strength and uh, partnerships have come from this. I mean, I know, I know we just talked about this before, uh, the Zooms, you know what I mean? All the meetings that we have now, the go-to meetings. I've never had so many go-to meetings and Zoom meetings in my life. I kind of like know more people now in my partnership and in the prisons and the ODM that, that I've ever known before. So that's a massive positive. So we're definitely going to be continuing all these Zooms. Um, change policies, like uh, Julia said, we were very quick as a team to risk assess. I mean, I'm super proud of the Hep C Trust and the management team, how uh, everything was put in place very quickly with PPE and staff were really looked after from the start and safety was 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 the main thing. And we still have this today, we have risk assessments before we go in the prison. So, you know, we're very professional on that side of things. If I had to change the way, the way we work, if that was changing hours or if it was changing just uh, anything around, you know, the ways of getting into prison, we've had to make uh, many a change on that side of front. And we've had to consider staff pressures. So quite a lot of our team don't have keys. 
So, you know, we don't want to be putting pressure on nurses who have to, sh you know, sh show us round and all this kind of stuff that we, we, we rely quite a lot on being, you know, supported. So we've only really gone into prisons where we've actually had keys ourselves, but we've gone in safely to make sure that, you know, we're going in to help the, the healthcare team. We're not going in to be a problem. Um, home testing, you know, we were very quick to be part of the NHS. So, you know, staff are all COVID tested on a Monday. And, you know, if we're going into prison, we make sure we're going into prison and we're not multi-spreading. So if we're going in two or three prisons in a different week or two, we're making sure that we're safe when we're going in. So, you know, we've been very, very careful. And then the vaccinations, you know, we've been very lucky that we've been part of the healthcare vaccinations in the prisons and more staff have had the first injection and the second one's coming. So, you know, for us, um, being patient and working really, really in a good partnership with everybody has been massively beneficial. And I'll do the next slide and I believe over to Julia. Thank you, Colin. So prisoner contact, um, we utilise the in cell phones to run support clinics. Uh, we did this alongside mostly ODN clinics. Um, really good tool because most uh, cells will have uh, an in-cell phone so uh, we just park up in healthcare and make calls directly into the men and women. We um, use the email prisoner service so that would be to keep in contact with our peers, to offer a general support um, and to do follow me through the gate work so we would hand over to our community team if someone was um, going to be getting released. Um, good old letter writing and sending cards. Uh, the residents always love to get a card. Um, we grew our helpline. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the next slide. But um, we're currently working on a video to be used via in-cell TV um, and in healthcare waiting rooms and reception areas. And it was also really important to liaise with our key contacts within the prison. Sometimes if we couldn't get in, they were our link. Next slide, please. Um, so the helpline was a service that um, we weren't using to its best ability and we certainly changed that around um, in lockdown. So we increased the hours to seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, it's staffed solely by our prison team. Um, so we all have lived experience. Um, to get the word out, we utilised the in-cell communication tools of Way Out TV and National Prison Radio. We included uh, the helpline number in all our literature, so all leaflet drops, in-cell packs and newsletters. Um, and moving forward, we're going to expand it um, and use it as a real communication tool just for more continuity and care. So maybe if... Um, a woman that's in one of my prisons um, wants to speak specifically to me, the female team can have that phone on a specific day. Um, so an example of uh, where the helpline has really worked is there was a patient in prison, he was awaiting results of his blood test. We were able to be the go-between for the resident and for healthcare. He got his blood results and we were able to support him when he called back. He was hep C positive. He left prison before starting a trip before starting his treatment, but we hooked him up with our community peers and he started treatment in a community. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Noah. So HAT and peer-to-peer. -peer. So HAT is our hepatitis awareness training. And um, our original training lasts about an hour and it's designed to be delivered to a group so we needed to change that because all group group sessions were stopped so uh, we developed a 15 minute hat designed for one-to-one -one use uh, it was 15 pages which can be flipped through as a conversation talking about bbvs transmission routes symptoms testing treatment and support just really um, getting it to the key messages next slide please Thank you. Over to you, Colin. Okay, thanks. So yeah, training peers. Um, this has been difficult because obviously the peers that we train is the, the main focus on the, in the, on the peer program for in the prison. But, you know, the concern was that we, we, we had a lot of peers in the prison. Uh, so first of all, you know, we had to use the in cell phones. We've used the, uh, the email prisoner just to try and reconnect with our peers to make sure that they were safe and well. 
uh, make sure everything was, you know, go, going fine. Uh, through them channels, we've managed to like hand out information through the drug services who then pass it on to the peers to then take on the wings because we're not able to go on the wings. So in general, the peers, the peers are still there, the peers are still doing well. Um, but finding new peers, we've had to work on, um, we've used this pen pal system, which I'm going to talk a little bit about more in the newsletter, where someone can write out, ask to be a peer. Uh, same as through the telephone, the helpline. Helpline's been very good for identifying peers as well. So once we've had somebody identified um, as a team, we, we made a little working group who went off and adapted the peer training, uh, made it more bite-sized. They made it uh, in a way where there's a training manual and it can actually be done in a different way. So, you know, we can do this one-to-one, -one, even on the in-cell telephone. So I know in Northumberland, uh, we've been training a peer over the phone, going in once a week, doing the peer training over the telephone, getting them ready for when we can actually meet face-to-face. -face. Uh, and like on the same thing, just retraining peers again, just using the phones or any little uh, short bite-sized contact that we can find. Uh, and uh, as always, we're on the lookout for peers. So that's always been a strength that's always continued in the work that we're doing. Next slide, please, Noah. So the newsletter, the newsletter has kind of been around for a little while, but we've used the newsletter now as like a like a tool. It's it's turned into something that's like a package now. And the picture we have on the side is just a picture one of the inmates drew for us. Like we've been having competitions, you know, because everybody's pushing everything into the cells to try and get to the to the prisoner or the patient. And we were trying to like give them something that they can actually use the games, the competitions, taking the mind off it, something that's got a little bit of a theme. Um, you know, we've, we've made this bigger, but inside the, inside the um, pack, we have like an in-cell workbook. So there's some harm minimization stuff in there as well. So there's a little bit of work that you can do. There's always a theme that we've been putting into the, into the uh, newsletters. But the biggest thing that's coming is this pen pal project. We've, we, we trialed this in uh, full Sutton. And we found a couple of pen pals who were really willing to do like a life story. They were sharing a lot of information. Just like Julia said, you know, if you're stuck in a cell for a long, long time and you have got a pen and paper or a newsletter comes in with a, with a, with a card already with a free post on it, you can write something down and post it back. People will, will use it. So the pen pals grown. We've got this huge adventure of World Hepatitis Day, how we're going to link up some pen pals from across the world internationally. See Julia smiling because this is kind of like our job. It's going to be a big piece of work, but you know this is what we do at the trust. We like to make things big. Um, inside the uh, newsletter, we have the helpline. You know, we have advertisements. We've got the World Hepatitis Day plans advertised in the next one. So it, it's a really good tool. It's a really nice working tool that the substance misuse team can also use as well and hand out. And the most important thing on the bottom is supports change talk. Because this is where we're at now. Uh, we know this now. We want to change COVID to Hep C. And this is how we're going to do it with the newsletters. We're going to be going out on the wings, doing outreach and handing these out and getting people to talk more about this virus rather than COVID. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and then the, the Way Out TV and Prison Radio, this has been a, a, a bit of a golden nugget, really discovering um, quite a lot of prisons have Way Out TV. Most prisons have uh, the radio. So we came up with some new ideas, some adverts. Um, we've had some fantastic adverts, which I know Noah has put on the website where uh, we speak about life stories. These are flashed up on the TVs that go through in the cell TVs. They're up in healthcare. You know what I mean? So there's always should always be some sort of video playing or some sort of uh, advertisement on the radio regarding and Hep C again, just to encourage that change talk to put Hep C back in the conversations. We made a helpline advert which really, you know, explains what the helpline's all about and increases the people to use the telephones. So adverts we're currently in the process of making at the minute. We have this <clears throat> competition going for World Hepatitis Day where we're going to rewrite the lyrics for 500 Miles for the Proclaimers. It's such an easy song and we're hoping that uh, some clever prisoner is going to come up with a rap or something and we're going to make it into a song. So again, just trying to get that positivity and something nice going. Uh, we're making a, a, another advert about the helpline number. We're doing a get tested advert. We're talking about treatment while in prison. And then the number five is we're letting people know about the prison to community follow me link, which 
the follow me, I do have to say, has been a massive, massive positive from what, we're, what we've achieved over the next 12 months. And me and Julie are going to tell you a couple of case studies from this. So the last time I did a webinar, uh, whoever tuned in uh, was myself and Carrie, and we talked about the prison follow me, prison in the community. It was kind of like just taking off. But I think eight months down the line, it's pretty much flashed across the whole of the UK now. Most of the ODNs are using this. So anybody that's coming in prison and serving a short sentence, the chaotic, they can still start treatment because the ODNs are referring this person straight to the Hep C trust consent. And our role is to go off into the community with our community partners and, and find, find this patient, introduce them to the community team, share life stories, get them involved and get them treated. So my quick case study is uh, from Durham Prison. And there was a follow me came through uh, from the prison, from the ODN, it came through in November. We spent a good few weeks over Christmas going off and trying to find just gentlemen in particular. Uh, just was never in, could never find them. Uh, we never gave up, we continued. And then one day when we knocked on his door, we found him. Uh, and I do have to say, he was psychotic. His mental health was all over the place. He's, his flat where he's living in was covered in needle, needles. He wasn't in a good shape. Um, we got to know him. Uh, we realised how isolated he was. He wasn't going down to the drug services. He was a typical fell through the net. And he was blaming his medication actually for making him psychotic. So he hadn't been taking it. Um, so introduced him to the peer educator in the community who was Sue. Uh, shared life stories, got a telephone number. And then all of a sudden he, he's ringing every week. Uh, we got him to the hospital, got his blood test done, uh, got him back onto treatment. We helped him remove all the needles from his flat and got him down to the needle exchange. And now we, we speak to him every week. And uh, when we're out in the community, we always pop down to his flat to make sure that he's taking his medication and that he's going to complete treatment. And that for me, just in a nutshell, kind of like shows how that missing, missing person really from prison to community had fell through the net can be picked up by the good work that follow me provides and I'll pass you over to Julia. Thank you Colin. Um, so yeah I'm going to talk about a case study of a follow me referral um, to the community for HMP Bronzefield. This was one that was a, a referral to the community but but then ended up going back in so it works both ways but um, so the ODN nurse completed a follow me referral at the earliest opportunity in clinic. Um, the patient was very quickly released homeless uh, the day before her meds arrived in the prison, which was hugely frustrating for us as a team. Um, so the Hepatitis C Trust made contact with probation and DIP. Um, she didn't attend either appointment. Um, very chaotic. Um, yeah, I just, just it, it, it's, um, it's not unusual for women to be released homeless and kind of disappear, disengage with services quite quickly. Um, so the women, the women's prison team picked up her medication and used the follow me information that the ODN nurse got, went out onto the streets to try and find her. Um, that was unsuccessful. Um, and then the clinical team leader in HMP Bronzefield alerted us and the ODN um, as soon as she arrived back in prison uh, for her breach of license because she didn't attend her appointments. Uh, the women's prison team returned her meds and the patient started her treatment. Um, women's prison team supported patient in a weekly phone clinic. She really had so much going on through her treatment. Um, uh, she lost her mum, her mum um, overdosed and, and passed away, her aunt passed away, um, her children were adopted and she had to do that over video link. I mean, she had so much going on uh, while she was on her treatment. At one point, she did stop taking her, her treatment and the women's prison team were alerted by prison healthcare and we gave her a call and just told her how important it is to get back on her treatment and she did, which was amazing. So um, she actually completed her treatment last week or the week before, it might have been the week before now, um, but we liaised with her recovery worker and the patient has now been referred to CGL Women's Wellness Zone for help and support with accommodation 
on release and she was released today and she will be supported uh, to her, her SVR 12 by our community team. So yeah. And that's us, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic, that's great guys. I thank you very much for that. And thanks for finishing with those case studies. I guess that is really the really important part is the individuals here. Um, I know we've slightly overrun, but I do want to just very quickly put some questions to everyone. Um, I know Graham has had to go, unfortunately. We had, so if you do have any questions in the audience, do type them in the chat or Q&A box. Um, one thing, one, we had, did have some questions come through in advance though. Um, I think they're best put to you, Mark, to start off with. Um, there are two, and the first one is, what is needed now to support peer-to-peer -peer services as part of routine HDV service commissioning post the elimination initiative? And the second question, if you sort of want to do this all in one go, is um, what's, what's sort of, has anything been happening with immigration removal centres? I know that you yourself had a bit about that on your slide, yeah. but I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of the the peer to peer work, um, obviously we've now um, work, we work really closely with um, Hep C Trust, and um, we've uh, got the community services all set up working with the NHS regions. So we've we've worked closely with the NHS regions to make sure that they've got um, contracts in place that run until at least uh, the end of March 2022 and I'm just about to go back into all of those contracts after we get through the 1st of April because I need to get all my plans uh, in place for next year to look at how those are extended in the future um, and similarly with the, the with the prison contracts through the uh, through the NHS regions um, the only one that's not going to be done through the regions is the women's uh, uh, peers and that's going to be done nationally through my team um, because it's too difficult with the women's prison estate being a national resource um, with one in this region one in that region for us to for us to commission them uh, differently how it will uh, go after the end of elimination uh, you know I, I don't know once we've eliminated then hopefully there's no need for the trust there's no need for me to have a job um, that you know that the, the plan is that once we've eliminated we've eliminated job done um, so I'm hoping we'll get to that stage um, but yeah um, we'll we'll keep monitoring that as we as we move along um, in terms of immigration removal centres, um, we did we started to do some work with the immigration removal centres pre-COVID, um, and um, that was going reasonably well. Um, it kind of all shut down this time last year, um, and the work in uh, certainly some of the immigration removal centres, um, the work changed significantly over the course of the pandemic. So a number of them emptied out, um, and were not operating in their in their usual way. So as they return to normal, um, that will be the next part on the um, on some of the justice system work that we're doing. So we'll have everything up and running ideally with prison reception testing working better and prison hits um, happening um, across the estate, both catching up on last year's ones that were deferred and doing new ones for 21-22. Um, and once we've got all of that kind of timetabled and in, we'll work with the immigration removal centres as a group um, because there's some really good practice in certainly in one of them um, that we want to share across the whole the whole estate. And obviously that brings in new partners like the Home Office that we need to work closely with. But based on our good work with Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, I'm quite confident that we can get a very good um, uh, work program in place for 21-22 for the immigration removal centres and get them up to really good reception testing and population testing through things like HITS. Great, thank you for that Mark. Um, does anyone else want to come in on that or can I go to the next question? Fab, I'll go on. Um, speaking of the Home Office, so recently there was announced some additional funding for substance abuse services. Um, I think it was, this was particularly around rehabilitation of people who've been released from prison. Um, this, this question was sort of cut off by our 
question form. Um, but are there any plans to sort of use that new money around hepatitis C or any ideas about how that could support elimination? Um, Mark or, or Stacey, do you, do you want to sort of take that? And, and I know the answer might be no, but... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to to briefly um, input that the, there is there is this additional funding that's been announced for 2122, um, 80 million pounds. Um, it's primarily linked to um, drug services and um, crime reduction. Um, however, one of the conditions within one of the uh, uh, specifications within the within the funding um, was that it could be used for harm reduction services and needle exchange so we we're working closely with PHE and uh, with local authorities to try to encourage them to use that as part of our kind of national prevention focus um, to review and increase um, needle exchange provision um, across England because it's in a significant number of places it's inadequate um, and not all of the uh, best equipment for infection control like low dead space syringes is being used or made available or promoted so we're working to try and kind of angle some of that towards the the national prevention work thanks stacy i can see you've unmuted I was just uh, going to support that really what Mark's just said. I think one of the, the key things for this um, is around making sure that the provision that we provide through our needle and syringe exchanges um, is absolutely, you know, top notch and that includes lots of harm reduction interventions so that when people come into that service that they're, they're greeted by, you know, a, you know, staff that have got expertise that we, you know, that they're engaged and um, because we do know a lot of those people that use our needle and syringe exchanges are not necessarily in service as well. So there's a real push to try and, you know, really motivate people, engage them to try and pull them into some more mainstream service because we know they're at high risk out there. So I think that we're really grateful from the substance misuse that money's been targeted towards that. Thanks very much for that, Stacey. Um, the final question we had a question come in about if there are any projects using dried blood spot testing i believe this came in from north america so maybe you know we are sort of answered that by talking about what we've done today but on, on that note um i know earlier in the year over the course of the pandemic getting tests to labs has been a real big issue has that sort of become less so now on i know in lots of places they sort of have to find local solutions and deals with their labs um Stacey, do you want to sort of start? Yeah, but for us, we, we've no wish now. We're, you know, it's pretty much uh, running. Uh, we've no wishes with dry blood spot testing and our labs, um, our one lab. So, we, you know, we, they were, I must admit, they were very supportive through the process as well. So we, we were lucky in a sense, you know, that it did. We definitely had some interruption, but at the moment now we're, we're sort of, we're back on track. Fab. Thanks. And then my sort of last question, unless anyone in the audience has anything to put in, um, Colin and Julia, um, we, we talked there about the, the referral pathway for Follow Me, which is where someone is released from prison during treatment and it interrupts their treatment and then the trust meets up with them in the community and follows up. This has sort of been, you've had a hard learning experience of this one, rolling it out during COVID. And, you know, you came and spoke to us about it back in September, October. Um, are there any sort of learnings you've had over the course of that or anything you think, you know, you're really looking to improve about that? Because it, it's a great thing, but um, a difficult thing to do. Yeah, I think we both talk, I talk from the male side of things, so the females, again, very, very different. Um, learning, I think for me, it's just the case of um, ODNs are now fully on board with it. I think at first it was a bit of a, a mixture around who was the lead, who was at the prison, T is at the prison healthcare, is the O, the N. But now I think the partnerships are all in place. Uh, there's been a lot of honorary contracts gone into place as well, which has been a double bonus, you know, for the prison team to have that in place as well as the community. Um, so yeah, yeah, you know, for me, it's been a, it's been a real, real success, but it's been modeled in different areas. Everybody's using it in a different way. And, and I love Julia's story, you know, I mean, the case study, it's now going back into the prison, which is exactly what we wanted in the first place. You know I mean? That when we are looking for somebody 
and we know they've gone back into prison. We're still following them into the, into the prison and out because that because we're in it both now. That's the whole idea. We've got everything covered. So for me, it's uh, it's been great. Yeah, um, um, the same as Colin. I mean the. The only way it works is with really good partnership work. Mm -hmm. We have to, that has to be tight. So it has to be a partnership with us, the ODN and prison healthcare. And when it, when that's tight, it just really works. And it has quite a, a far reach. So it doesn't end with the women that come out. We also can engage their partners and get them treated as well. And I, I mean, honestly, it was such a, a stress for me to pick one follow me example because there's so many amazing ones so um so yeah it's really it's really working it has a, a further reach than that one person who is referred so yeah, in terms of reinfection and stuff it's massive yeah i've known that i know the northeast are very keen for knee packs to be involved now so that's another family team coming up coming up it's just evolving you know what i mean this this follow me can evolve for sure on the family side yeah that's great thank you both um so on that note, I will sort of draw things to a close there. Thank you everyone who has come to speak and thank you everyone who has um, come to listen as well. Um, and thank you for all you've done over the past year, um, keeping things going during this trying time. Um, in terms of what next from this webinar, we will send around a feedback form via email. Please do fill that in. Let us know what you thought of this. Um, these feedback forms do help us decide what we do in the future. Um, we did a similar one to this webinar after the first wave and that got really good feedback, which is why we're doing this. So um, do let us know, we do respond to it and we do change things accordingly. If you're getting Zoom fatigued, please do let us know. <laughs> Been a lot of webinars in the past, over the past year. Um, but yeah, all that remains for me to do is just thank everyone for coming to speak today. Thank you all, have a good weekend. <laughs>